In the previous video of this series I introduced you to the Stream Writer and the Stream Reader, which can be used to read and write data from text files. At the end of that video I suggested a few things you might like to try for yourself, for example taking data from an array variable and writing that out to a text file, and then maybe reading data from a text file back into an array variable. I also suggested that you copy data from one text file to another. In this video I'm going to show you how I solved those problems, and I'm also going to show you a few extra features of the Stream Writer and the Stream Reader. This is my original program which wrote data out to a text file. This line of code creates a new Stream Writer object. A Stream Writer is an object that sits between my application and the text file itself, and it manages the process of writing data into that file. Blocks of data are sent to the Stream Writer, and that data is held in a buffer until the Stream Writer gets round to writing it into the file. It does actually happen very quickly. Here I've got the path and the name of the file which I want to write into, and the parameter true says that if the file already exists I'm going to add new data to the existing file. If the file doesn't already exist it'll be created automatically. This is the folder where the file will be created. It's on my D drive and it's called Delmi. When I run the program A new file has been created, and there's the data which I've written into it. This program reads data from the file. This time I'm creating a new stream reader object, and all it needs to know is the path and the name of the file which I want to read from. I'm using a loop which scans the file. Whatever's inside this loop will continue until I get to the end of the stream, which effectively means the end of the file. And you can see that I'm reading one line at a time by calling the readLine method of the stream reader object. Don't worry too much about the object-oriented terminology which I'm using here. Suffice to say, it's a style of programming and it works. Very important when you're finished with a stream writer or a stream reader you must close it afterwards. So you can see in my first program I'm closing the stream writer, and in this program I'm closing the stream reader. Something I'd like to mention briefly is I can also call the read to end method of a stream reader, which is exactly what I'm doing here. I'm not using a loop at all. I've declared a regular string variable, which I've given the name st all, and then I'm calling the read to end method of the stream reader, and what comes back goes straight into that variable. And you can see I have the data back all in one go. I should point out, however, that that data has all come into a single string variable. If I want to work with those data items separately, this isn't going to be appropriate. Something else I'd like to mention is that I can read from a text file one character at a time. This program is very similar to one I've already written, but instead of calling read line, I'm simply calling read. Let's take a look what happens when I run this. Now I'm just getting numbers. These are ASCII codes. ASCII code 13 is actually a carriage return, and ASCII code 10 is a line feed. And then I'm getting the ASCII codes for each separate character of the next name, and then another carriage return, and another line feed. This isn't much use to me. I'm going to convert these ASCII codes back into characters which I can read. As simple as that. Let's try again. That's the first name, Kevin. The carriage return and the line feed are not producing visible characters, but here comes the next name. 
and then another carriage return, and another line feed, and then the next name. And so on. I'll show you how I've made use of the read command in just a moment. Now in the last video, I suggested that you try writing the contents of an array variable out to a text file. You might, for example, want to save the high scores of a game. I've declared an array variable here, and I've initialised it manually. I've hard-coded the data, just for demonstration purposes, but chances are a much bigger program would collect these data somehow. Suffice to say, then, I have a one-dimensional array, and there's a number in each element of that array. As before, I've declared a stream writer. This time I'm going to create a file called highscores.txt. Notice also I'm using false as the second parameter here, because if the file exists, I want to overwrite it, I want to replace it completely. Once my stream writer has been declared and initialised, I'm scanning the array variable using a for next loop. And you can see that when I call write line, I feed it the contents of one of the elements of that array. Let's give this a try. Scores have been saved, and I have a new text file called High Scores. There's my data written to the file. If I change the data and then run the program again, I still only have one High Scores file, but this time with the new data in it. Reading data back into my program from the text file was relatively simple as well. I've declared an array variable of five elements, but of course this array is empty. I haven't initialised any of those elements. I declare and initialise my stream reader, and then I'm using a relatively simple for loop to scan the file. I can do this because I know how big the file is. I know how many items of data there are in there. So each time I pass through the loop, I call the read line method of the stream reader, and I take that piece of data and put it into one of the elements of the array. Close the stream reader and report that the scores have been retrieved. This little loop is simply there to prove that it's worked. I'm scanning the array afterwards just to show that the data is actually in there. Scores retrieved. And there they are. Well, so far, so simple. But what if I want to save the names and the scores into a text file? Writing those data out to a file is a relatively simple business. This time, I've declared a two-dimensional array. It really does help if you make a little sketch of it. You can visualise this two-dimensional array as having two columns and five rows. Of course, the columns and the rows are numbered from zero. And here I'm initialising the array. So we can see that David has a score of 12, Sally has a score of 20, Beatrix has a score of 25, Mervyn's score is 38, and Kevin's score is 47. I declare and initialise my stream writer, and now I'm using a for loop to write the data into the file. I've called my loop counter y, because I like to think of my two-dimensional array as having an x dimension and a y dimension, so you can see my loop is counting from 0 to 4. I'm scanning down the rows, and every time I pass through the loop, I write a new line into the text file. That line of text includes a name and a score which comes from the same row. If you're not sure about what's going on here, I suggest you go back and brush up on two-dimensional arrays. Once the data are in the file, I can close my stream writer. Scores and names have been saved. And let's take a look at the file. Writing names and scores out to a text file was a relatively simple business if you can work with two-dimensional arrays. But to be honest, reading data like these back into a program from a text file 
was problematic. This was my original program. I'll talk you through this first because it was an interesting programming challenge, but then I'll show you a much easier way of achieving the same effect. I start by declaring a two-dimensional array variable. Of course, there's nothing in it to begin with. I declare my stream reader, as usual, and then I have a number of variables which my program makes use of. I'm using a do loop to scan the file, and I'm scanning to the end of the stream. I guess I could have used a for loop because I know how many items there are in the file, but I took this approach for no particular reason. Now I'm starting by calling the peak method of the stream reader. The peak method will look at the next character in the stream, that is, the next character in the file, but it won't consume it. Imagine there's a cursor inside my file getting ready to pick up the next character. When I call peak, it will look at the next character, but it won't move the cursor on. So I'm having a, a sneaky look at what's coming next, and I load that character into a variable which I've declared called iCurrentChar my current character. Notice I've declared it as an integer, because as you've seen, when you call read, you actually get an ASCII code back. Then I'm testing the ASCII code, and I'm saying if it's not 32, which I know is a space, remember the name and the score are separated by a space, and if it's not the number 13, which is a carriage return, and it's not the number 10, which is a line feed, and if I'm currently reading somebody's name, notice how I've declared a Boolean variable called reading name, which I've set to true to begin with. If all of those conditions are met, then I'm going to read the character, consume it. So I'm calling the read method of the stream reader. Now I don't want the ASCII code, I actually want the character that the ASCII code represents, so you can see I've wrapped that up inside the char function, which converts the ASCII code into a readable character, and then I'm concatenating that onto a string called current name. So let the current name equal whatever the current name used to be, and then this extra character. I'm reading the name a character at a time, and I'm building up a string which will contain the whole name. If, however, the current character is the number 32, it means that I've encountered a space on that line. In other words, I finished reading the name. I'm about to start reading the score. So I set this Boolean variable to false. I'm no longer reading the name. And then I want to advance my imaginary cursor inside that text file without actually consuming any data. So I simply call the stream readers read method. There's nowhere for the character which I'm reading to go. If the current character is not a space, and it's not a carriage return, and it's not a line feed, and I'm not reading the name, then I must be reading the score. So I read the character, and I concatenate it to a string variable called stCurrentScore. This time I'm building up a string with the score in it. If the current character is 13, then I know I've got to the end of the line. That's a carriage return, so all I want to do is advance the cursor. If the current character is 10, I know that I've hit the line feed, which comes after the carriage return, so again, I just want to advance the cursor without consuming anything. At this stage, then, I know that ST current name contains the name of the player, and ST current score contains their score. So I can now put those data into my array variable, which is what's going on here. Notice that I'm referencing a particular row in the array with a variable which I've declared called row count. And once the data are in the array, I then increment row count. Thinking about it, if I'd used a for loop, I could have got away without this. Having read one name and one score, I then reinitialize all of these variables, and round the loop we go again. Now I must admit this took quite a bit of effort to get it working, and then it dawned on me that there is an easier way. 
This programme does exactly the same thing. I declare my empty two-dimensional array variable, declare and initialize my stream reader. I have a string variable called current score, which I use to actually pick up the name and the score that goes with it. And I've got a temporary array variable here, which I haven't specified any dimensions for. I'm using a for loop to scan down the rows of my array variable. And inside the loop, I call the read line method of my stream reader. So that pulls the name and the score into this variable st current score. This message box command I just left there because I was testing the program. And here's the clever bit. I'm using the split method of a string. And what the split method does is it splits that string into separate substrings wherever it finds this particular character. In my case, my delimiter, as it's known, is a space. So what I end up with when this command is called is my temporary array, which has two pieces of data in it, the name and the score. This is just a one-dimensional array, so I pick up the first element of that one-dimensional array and I pop it into my two-dimensional array. That's the name of the person. And then I take the next element of that temporary array and I pop it into the adjacent element of my two-dimensional array. So I now have the name and the score. And around the loop we go again to pick up the next name and score. A much more elegant solution, I think. To test this program out, I could write a little loop which builds an output string, but all I'm going to do is stick a breakpoint here and then examine the contents of the array variable in my locals window. There's the message which I put in the code for testing purposes. And here's my locals window. And there's my high scores array with the data from the text file. Something else I suggested you could try is copying data from one text file to another. To do this, I'm going to need a stream reader and a stream writer. So you can see here, I've got a stream reader and a stream writer, and I've initialized them both here. And I'm taking a bit of a sledgehammer approach to start with. I've got a variable called st all data, which is just a regular string variable, and then I call the high score readers read to end method, which you'll remember pulls all of the data out of that text file and puts it into that string variable. Then I'm just using the write line method of my stream writer to put all of that data into the target file. Watch what happens. This is going to create a new file called highscorescopy.txt. There's a copy of my original high scores file. It's an identical copy. And if you think about it, I don't even need that string variable to do exactly the same thing. Let's comment out these lines of code and bring this one to life. This does exactly the same thing. Notice I'm calling the read to end method of my stream reader, and what comes back is being passed directly to the write line method of my stream writer. But you might be thinking, this is cheating a little bit, and the truth is, if all I wanted to do was make an identical copy of a file, there are other ways to work with the file system, which I'll show you in another video. This program is arguably a better approach because I can copy data from one file to another conditionally. As before, I've created and initialized a stream reader and a stream writer. I'm scanning the source file and I'm reading each item in the source file a line at a time and putting it into iScore. And then you can see I'm testing iScore. If iScore is bigger than or equal to 25, I'm only interested in the really high scores, then I will write that score into my target file. Let's see this one in action. So there's my original high scores file. And here's my copy. And you can see 
I've only copied items which are bigger than 25. Now there are even more things I can do with stream readers and stream writers. For example, if I want to write a very large amount of data out to a file, I can do so asynchronously. In other words, the process can happen in the background without the main program having to wait. Asynchronous programming, as it's called, means that you can write applications which are much more responsive. I'll talk more about asynchronous programming and multi-threading and multitasking in a later video.